How do you classify a performer who helped create a genre, starred in half a dozen features still widely considered classics today? Casey Donovan was one of the first and most likely the only gay porn star who ever had a chance of crossing into the mainstream. Donovan had done a porn film, but after Boys, he became an underground celebrity. In tonight's episode, we're going to celebrate Casey Donovan, who was a mainstream model, porn star, writer, and an inevitable advocate all in one lifetime. This is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande, and if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped to get off. Before we continue, I want to remind you to help this channel by clicking the subscribe button and selecting the bell icon for notifications to see more content like this. Casey Donovan was born John Calvin Culver on November 2, 1943, in East Bloomfield, New York, to Donald and Arlene Culver. Young Cal grew up handsome, athletic, and prone to mischief. Donovan grew up driving tractors and horses on a farm. His family later had supplemental income by adding a tourist camp, lodges, and trailer parking to their property. Their home was not far from the Finger Lakes region of New York, which was close to many popular holiday resorts away from city life. The area was also home to many religious sects. Donovan describes his upbringing as somewhat secular. Naturally, after his home became host to tourists from big cities and all of their trades and customs, Donovan was intrigued. At night, Donovan would walk around the campgrounds and hear strange moaning sounds, not being able to decipher whether they were good or bad. Since they were doing it every night, he assumed it couldn't be bad. He then discovered these strange moans were also coming from outdoors and in the woods. He would often help his mother clean the cabins and bathrooms. It was during this time that he became fascinated with the communal shower and the disregard for Victorian standards of casual nudity. Once puberty hit, Donovan realized he was attracted to other men, however, he did not have the knowledge to recognize it as homosexuality at the time. He was noticeably attractive, and many of the visitors would flirt with him. Donovan spent the later end of his young adult life honing his sexual appetite and technique. The climate of the country, however, was repressive, and throughout the 50s, gays were driven underground, barred from federal employment, purged from the military, and categorized as sick by the psychiatric community. There are a lot of kids here. There may be some girls that'll turn lesbian. We don't know. But it's serious. Don't kid yourselves about it. They can be anywhere. They can be judges, lawyers. We ought to know we've arrested all of them. So if any one of you have let yourself become involved with an adult homosexual or with another boy, and you're doing this on a regular basis, you better stop quick. Because one out of three of you will turn queer. Where Donovan grew up, the feeling was all too close to home. He attended Canandaigua Academy for high school, where under the tutelage of a lifelong teacher and mother figure, he was encouraged into the dramatic arts. He went to college to pursue a teaching degree. As the decade of the 60s was underway, the shifting cultural changes were shaping. Black Americans, women, and gays were demanding equal rights, and many were outright protesting the war in Vietnam. With this as its backdrop, Donovan would attend a small teacher's college in Genesco, 30 miles from his home, where he quickly got involved in student life. He grew into his roles on stage, however large or small. Donovan was stage struck. He graduated in 1965 with a contract to teach in Peekskill, New York. He would often find himself teaching during the day and several times a week taking trips into New York City, indulging in culture and sex. When Donovan's first year in Peekskill was over, he decided not to renew his contract and made his way into Central Park West, teaching at the Ethical Culture Fieldston School that catered to children of the wealthy and famous. Putting up with many temper tantrums and spoiled kids eventually took its toll, and one day, Donovan grabbed a student and gave them a swift kick in the ass. That student was Eli Wallace's daughter. As fate would have it, after turning in his keys and leaving his job without having saved any money, Donovan met an older gentleman in a beautiful red Cadillac convertible who smiled at him. Within minutes, he was sitting in the plush car driving around New York. Within hours, they were sitting at dinner when this man, a doctor from Riverdale, was inquiring about a business transaction, an exchange of money for sexual services rendered. Although he would take job stints in summer stock and waiting tables, hustling became Donovan's means to make money. Donovan would be more than a one-night stand interaction. 
His good looks would attract men who could afford to shower him with tailored suits, elegant dinners, and chauffeured transportation. He continued escorting for the next year, traveling through Europe thanks to well-placed clients and their recommendations on who and where to visit. Upon his return to the United States, one of his clients thought Donovan should try his hand at modeling and steered him to the Wilhelmina Agency. Donovan's modeling career was almost immediately successful, pulling in $60 an hour to do print ads in Reader's Digest and flying to Rome for Valentino's fall collection. Mail order catalogs, the New York Times Sunday magazines, book covers, underwear boxes. By the end of the 60s, Donovan was moving forward. While modeling and still escorting on the side, Donovan yearned to be on stage. Being in print ads garnered the attention of some playwrights and directors, but nothing that stood out. Donovan got a phone call one day from a cast member from a play he worked on. Just totally out of the blue. I'd really kind of forgotten about her, but we had exchanged phone numbers. And she said, uh, a friend of mine has written and is directing a new film. It's a gay film and it's hardcore. And they had someone to star in the movie. But this kid chickened out and backed out and it's going to be shot in three days. And I told him about you and I told him that you would be terrific and that you should get $125 a day and I'll take 15%. He agreed that I should do the film. He never asked me to take my clothes off. He never asked me if I thought that I could get it up on camera, whatever. Uh, three days later, we started filming this movie in New Jersey, which turned out to be Casey, where I got the name Casey Donovan from. It wasn't a walk on the beach yet, as Donovan would recall performing in front of a straight crew and a mostly straight cast doing it for money. Donovan then met Wakefield Pool on Fire Island and was shown the first segment of Pool's project. Donovan was entranced. He thought it was so beautiful, he agreed to be in it and not get paid, although he would be. Originally only appearing in one segment, the model who appeared in the first segment would not agree to sign model releases upon hearing Pool's plan to distribute the film. The segment would be reshot with Donovan instead. Poole then decided to have Donovan featured in all three segments, loosely tying the film together. After the release, Donovan was immediately recognizable in New York City, and once it was released around the country, he was a national celebrity. After his popularity increased, Donovan became very aware of his image and what his fans liked. He always thought of Casey's reputation. Donovan went on to audition and landed a role on Broadway in Captain Brass Bond's Conversion, starring Ingrid Bergman. He then received an offer to star in another hardcore film, The Back Row. He had concerns of the film's themes, and although he enjoyed the lifestyle, Donovan felt the movie was trashy and not what fans of Casey Donovan would be turned on by. The film got decent reviews. The director, Jerry Douglas, then offered Donovan a role in his film adaption of the play Score, which was shot in Yugoslavia a country under the Iron Curtain where homosexuality didn't exist. It was a bit of culture shock for a production shooting a film with closeted gay themes. Donovan also began a marketing campaign for After Dark magazine in New York City. The first cover of the magazine was on newsstands in America by the time Donovan returned from Europe. By now, Casey Donovan was everywhere, even if you didn't watch porn. There were serious possibilities for mainstream movies, meeting with directors John Schlesinger and Raymond St. Jacques, who both encouraged him. Although not much came of these meetings, the attempt and interest was there. Soon after, rumors began to fly and Donovan began to lose modeling jobs. Legitimate projects never materialized. Porn films rolled in and dependable money came from escorting. Donovan struggled with the success the name Casey Donovan brought him, but knew if he wanted to be Cal Culver, something had to give. And at the moment, Boys in the Sand was an albatross defining him forever as the golden boy of porn. Donovan took part in a straight porn film, The Opening of Misty Beethoven. But that film seemed like the end of the line for him. He had some success with small plays on the West Coast and began to have a more stationary lifestyle with an ongoing gig. Beginning in 1972, Donovan had been in an on-and-off relationship with actor and writer Tom Tyron for five years. Tyron, who was deeply closeted, met Donovan years before and they had a less than stellar sexual encounter. One night, during a house party, Tom and Casey met again and the sparks were instant. Tom liked Donovan's sexual energy and Tom was everything Donovan admired, a successful handsome actor turned writer who was a part of Hollywood. Tom remained very closeted throughout their relationship, although he was present wherever Donovan was. 
Tyrion even accompanied Donovan to the West Coast and stayed with him where he was acting on a stage play. Word gets around, and the temptation of such a salacious story proved too hard to ignore. Donovan and Tyron had planned a getaway together to East Hampton. Tyron then saw a gossip column in The Hollywood Reporter asking, what male porn star is honeymooning on Long Island with an actor turned writer? Tyron panicked, packed his suitcase, and flew back to Los Angeles, turning his back on the entire situation and never seeing Donovan again. While Donovan was incredibly hurt, he understood why Tyron did what he had to do. At this point, Casey Donovan realized he had to make a comeback. In 1978, Falcon Studios, now a premier producer of gay erotica, provided Donovan a great vehicle for a comeback, The Other Side of Aspen. The Other Side of Aspen was Falcon's first big hit, thanks in part to Donovan's performance, as well as other porn stars featured in the film. At the beginning of the 1980s, it started to become clear that there was a dark catastrophe on the horizon. The news began to refer to it as the gay cancer. New cases and new symptoms were being certified every week. There was outright denial at first from the gay community who had just made so many advances in sexual freedom. Living in New York, Donovan was aware of the growing epidemic but continued his hedonistic ways. Donovan and thousands of other sexually active gay men chose to close their eyes to the realities of what was going on until the death toll became too horrifying to deny any longer. By 1982, Donovan began to warn readers about the new gay cancer through his column, Letters to Casey. He told readers to limit sex partners, give up drugs, and take care of themselves physically. At the same time, though, Donovan was making his raunchiest films, having recently started working with filmmaker Christopher Rage, a gay erotic filmmaker with an extremely personal and raunchy vision of gay sex. Donovan didn't seem to adhere to his own advice, but in fairness to Donovan, it must be noted that he was not alone in this decision. The sequel to Boys in the Sand once again reunited Wakefield Pole with Donovan. By the time it was released in 1986, the buzz had dissipated and VCRs were readily churning out porn to a home video market. The field had started to crowd. In 1984, Donovan fell ill and he was in complete denial. He made a pair of safe sex films, Chance of a Lifetime, and Inevitable Love for the gay men's health crisis and turned his energy and attention to the AIDS crisis. Unfortunately, Donovan just couldn't follow his own advice. By 1986, Donovan knew something was wrong, but refused to face it. He did, however, become morbidly fixated on death. The ever-optimistic Casey Donovan spent the last couple of days of his life continually offering advice and advocacy through his column and going to friends' funerals. By his final film appearance, Donovan's health and well-being were all too hard to ignore. As gay video magazine manshots would call it, a haunting study of self-destruct. A pathetic footnote to a glittering career. An unsettling record of the golden boy on a collision course with his own mortality. In his final days, Casey Donovan flew to Florida to visit his family. Days later, on Sunday, August 10th, John Calvin Culver. Casey Donovan was dead. At the moment, I'm working on a novel, which um, a publisher here in New York uh, has agreed to do. I've been working on it since June, and um, it's um, a fictional autobiography as opposed to a factional novel. Uh -huh. And uh, by and large, my editor is very pleased at this point. And it's about this shy, square, naive kid from upstate New York who comes to New York and becomes uh, You're from the biggest upstate. gay porno star. Mm -hmm. He never got to write his own story, but countless gay men and porn lovers can attest to the influence Casey Donovan played in their lives at one point or another. Through it all, Casey Donovan remained poised, handsome, and sexually desirable. Casey Donovan filled the gap in the fantasy fabric of gay life. An adult handsome man who found his niche and helped fulfill this pent-up demand for mature porn actors. Casey Donovan's image will live on every time someone watches one of his films. Fun fact, 
Casey Donovan invested a good deal of the money he made hustling into a property on Key West he called Casa Donovan. He wanted to create an amazing bed and breakfast for gay tourism. He poured tons of money into the house, but unfortunately, it never turned out right. Unfortunately, Donovan was forced to keep hustling to make mortgage payments, and the house couldn't keep up with the competition in the area. Donovan had such great times, and there's amazing stories that came out of this era, but eventually lost Casa Donovan in 1985. You've been watching Demystifying Gay Porn. I am your host, Ike Grande. Demystifying Gay Porn can be found on every podcast directory as well as YouTube. Demystifying Gay Porn is on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Telegram. If you like what you're watching and want to be a part of the process, head over to patreon.com backslash demystifying gay porn, where you can help this YouTube channel and I can continue making content like this. Once again, this is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande. And if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped you get off. Cheers. Thank you.